And now it's time to preview an upcoming game with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to take a look at another Kickstarter preview. This time, we're going to take a look at Coinage by Adam P. McIver. Now, this is a micro game that's going to be published by Tasty Minstrel Games, but we'll be looking for support on Kickstarter. They'll be running a Pledge What You Want campaign with a minimum of $3 to get you the entire game. Before I go too much into it, real quick, why don't we just take a look at how the game plays. We'll take a look at what the components will look like, and a reminder, these are somewhat prototype quality components, not the final components, and then we'll come back here, and I'll sum it all up for you at the end. Here you can see what is essentially the actual components for Coin Age. Now, what I'm showing you are actually prototype components. These are not the final components. The card quality may change a little bit. There may be some minor modifications, but essentially what you see here is what you're going to get. The rules are printed on four different sides, or four sides of two different cards. So it's really short rule book. It's going to have all of the information you need on how to play the game. It has some background story on the game, and of course, it has the rules, which are here on the second through fourth pages, including scoring and the different rankings of cards. Now, in order to actually make this game, which you will have to do, you're going to need about a dollar fifty-six, or exactly a dollar fifty-six and change. You can see I have some unmarked change here. Each player will need four dimes. They're going to need three pennies, two nickels, and one quarter a piece. Now, now that you've seen the components in actuality, I'm going to switch over and show you in a little bit larger version so you can see the game a little bit better as it plays. So here you can see a much larger map for coinage than the one you will actually get when you pledge. It's about the size of a credit card, great for portability, fits in your wallet, but not great for showing on video, thus the larger map. When you look at this map, you will see several different regions. We have a tan, a light green, a dark green, and a yellow region, which have different numbers of areas in them. For example, the tan is a one area region, the Silver City, while as the two area region over here, the Plains of Cash, is in light green. We have a three region area, or three area region, the Forests of Coindor, in darker green, and we have a four area region in yellow, the Copper Peaks. At the start of the game, you will determine who will be the first player with a coin flip, because each of these coins is two-sided. So one player will be silver, the other player will be gold, and you'll have a coin flip to see who's going to go first. So we'll say it comes up silver. The silver player will be first in this turn, or in this game, and at the start of their turn, they're going to grab one each of their remaining ranks of coins. So for example, they have a one, a two, a three, and a four. Now you'll see that if you place your 4 on your turn, you will not have a 4 on your second turn. And that means on your next turn, if you were to pick up one of each rank, you'd pick up a 1, a 2, and a 3. So on certain turns, you may be playing with less coins than on other turns. This is perfectly okay, it's part of the game. So, our player now has one of each of their coins in their hand. And what they're going to do at this point is they're going to shake these cards up in their hands and slam them down on the table. This will randomize them and hopefully some of the coins will flip up face up, with your own side matching, and some will flip face down with your opponent's side matching. Now, I'm unable to shake these up and slam them down on the table because the designer's given me such a ridiculously sized prototype. So, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take all these coins and I'm going to throw them up in the air to randomize them, hoping they land on the table and you'll be able to see the results. So, let's go. Here we go. All right, there we go. We have two and two. I have matched two of my own color and two of my opponent's color are showing. Based on these results, you're going to be able to see what actions you can take, and that's going to be based on this card here. This card will outline all of the possible flipping results you could have and tell you what actions you're allowed to take on that turn. So we'll see here that I match two, which means I may place two of my coins out onto the board. So I would move these off of here, and I would be able to place the two matching coins out onto the board if I wanted to. I could place the three and the one. Now, you'll see there are different results based on how many coins you match with your own color. For example, if I had matched four, so all four of the coins were the same color, my color, I would be able to place two of them. Or, if I paid one of the coins, meaning I gave one of these coins to my opponent, I would be able to place the remaining three. So the more you match will potentially give you an option to play more on the board, but you have to give up one of your coins permanently and give your opponent a coin permanently in order to do so. If I had matched three, it's the same as matching two. I'd be able to place two of those coins and place the remaining one back in my supply. If I had only matched one, I would be able to place that one coin, and then I would be able to move any one stack of coins, you'll see stacks shortly, to a different empty area. And 
If I had matched none, which is not really an option on the first turn, you'd have to simply rethrow the coins, but if I had matched none on a future turn, I'd be able to capture and then move one stack of coins. Capturing simply means to pull the top coin of a stack or any single coin off of the board and add it to your supply. It changes influence out on the board and will give you another coin to play later. But for now, I matched two to my own color, so I will place those two coins out onto the board. The remaining two coins are going to go back to my supply for later use. So, I now have a one and a three to play to the board. I will probably play my one to the Silver City. It's a one area region. This is the strongest coin for maintaining my control, and it gives me control of the entire area. So it will score a bunch of points, or it will score double points at the end of the game. The three is a little bit less strong. It's going to be easier to take over. So maybe I decide to place the three out into the Copper Peaks. I don't really plan on maintaining control of this, but this is an area with a lot of, or a region with a lot of areas, so I can probably regain control of the region later. After I've finished my placements, I've placed my two coins, it's going to go to my opponent's turn, and he's going to take one of each of his ranks of coins. So he has a one, a four, a two, and a three. And he would likewise shake them up and toss them into the air. Now I'm just going to simulate this throw, and we'll say that all of his coins came up the same color, all his color. So he's got four matches, and as I showed you earlier, four matches is going to be placing two, or paying one, and placing the remaining three. Let's say he decides to do the latter. He decides he doesn't really want his quarter. It's great for scoring points, but it's really not very good for keeping control of areas. So he decides to give this to his, an oppo his opponent, which will go into their supply. From this point on, he's now allowed to play his remaining three, because he has paid one. And so he can place these out onto the board. Maybe he decides to place his three, likewise, in the Copper Peaks. He's not real worried about the value of that coin, and again, they can fight over control of the Copper Peaks later. He now has a two and a one, and he decides the two is a little bit more important. He decides he's going to place this two, hoping his opponent doesn't get a one to place over it, uh, out here in the Plains of Cash. And he now has a one left, and he actually is going to now fight for control of the Copper Peaks. He's decided now is the time. Uh, he's a little bit early, but it's okay, and he's going to place his one on top of his opponent's three. He can do this because the 1 is of a lower rank than the 3 that's already on the board. So he could place this 1 on top of a 4, a 3, or a 2, all because it's got a lower rank. And now the 1 is in control of this area of the Copper Peaks. After finishing placing all three of his coins, it would go back to the silver player, and the silver player definitely still has at least one of each rank left, a one, two, three, and a four. He actually still has two quarters left, so he's going to be playing with quarters for quite some time. Again, he would shake these up and either throw them in this case or slam them down on the table in the actual game. Again, I'm going to simulate the results, saying that these coins come up all not matching his own color. As we saw earlier, no matches is capture and then move. So how does this work? What is capturing and what is moving? Well, that's pretty easy to explain. Capturing is simply pulling any one coin off of the top of a stack or any coin, single coin, off of any region. So, we are on the silver player's turn. He clearly doesn't want to pull his own dime off of the silver city, but he may want to pull the, va the valued one coin off of here and add it to his own supply, giving him control back of this area of the Copper Peaks. So, he does so, he's going to capture this coin, simply by pulling it off of the top and adding it back to his supply. At this point, he is allowed to move a coin, and so maybe he decides that he's going to fight for control of the Copper Peaks, and in order to do so, he's going to move this three-value coin over to the Force of Coin Door. It gives him a little bit better option of taking all of these areas, and it moves this player over to here, where they can still fight for contention of the Forest of Coin Door. Now that you've seen all of the different types of action, we've seen placing, moving, paying, and capturing, why don't I really quickly show you a simulated end of game scoring scenario after all of the coins have been placed. Here we can see an end game condition for coinage simulated. Now there are two ways for the game to end. Either each one of the areas has a coin placed in it, so for example on a player's turn they place their coin into the last area, that immediately ends the game. Alternatively, if there were a bunch of areas empty, but a player played their last coin overall, having no more in the supply, that would also immediately end the game, and then you would go on to a scoring. Scoring in coinage is relatively simple. What you're going to do is you're going to score based on the face value of your coins that control regions. So we'll see we have many ones and twos for the gold player, while we have a three and a four for the silver player. Now, there's a little bit more to it than that. 
what you're going to do is you're going to look at who controls each of the regions. And in a region you control, all of your coins will double their value. So, let's take a look here. We have the Silver City. This, player, this area is clearly controlled by the gold player. They have a value there of 1, but since they control it, it's going to be a value of 2. That player gets 2 points for that area. We can go over to the planes of cash. And this area is actually not controlled, or this region is not controlled by either player, because each player controls one area. So it's a tie there. Each one of these coins is worth their face value. One for silver and one for gold. That brings gold to three and silver to one. We would then move on to the three area region. And you're going to see here that we have a control by the gold player. So gold is going to get double their face value coins. So they get two more, bringing them to five, and four more, bringing them to nine while the silver player is going to get one, which brings them to two. Currently a score of nine to two. Finally, we would score the last region over here, the yellow region, which is the Copper Peaks. We can see that silver clearly controls this, so they're going to get double face value, which is going to be a lot of points. Our gold player will only get one, so that brings them up to ten. But we have eight, nine, ten, and six more is sixteen, plus the two that silver already had is eighteen. That brings us to eighteen to ten. In addition to points scored out on the board, you're going to score points for leftover coins. So each coin that a player has left in their bank is going to be one. Now there are currently four coins off of the board. Three of them belong to the gold player currently, and one of them belongs to the silver player. So gold will get three more points, bringing them to 13, while silver will get one more, bringing them to 19. And we have a victory for the silver player. Basically, each game is going to play out in this manner, where you flip the coins, get actions based on that, play the actions out as best as possible, and try and get control over the different areas of the map in order to score the most victory points at the end of the game. Of course, having higher coins out on areas to control them is better, so strategically placing those and hoping your opponent cannot place over them to seize control from you will get you a lot of points. Either way, whoever best manages to do all of this is going to be the winner of Coinage. And there you have it. That is Coin Age by Adam McIver and Tasty Minstrel Games. A very portable game, one that fits basically in your pocket, using mostly pocket components anyway, change you could be carrying around, and a credit card sized card, uh, and it has a decent amount of strategy to it. Uh, the randomization of actions using the coins is very clever. I like it a lot, and again, it's just so portable you can whip it out, play it anywhere, uh, and essentially it's going to be teachable to almost anyone. So, they are looking for your support. It's $3 minimum, $5 suggested pledge. Uh, they're going to have upgrades if they reach certain goals. They're going to have credit card quality material. Uh, if they get to a certain point, they're going to have uh, punch tokens for the coins so you don't have to supply your own coins. But overall, they're just looking for your support, your help, and I'm sure they would appreciate it. Thanks for watching our review today. For more information about board games, as well as the number one board game audio podcast, check out Dicetower.com for reviews, interviews, and more. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Yeah. Yeah.